Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern and that means it's time to begin another of our monthly Coco Ross Weather Talk webinars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis, and along with me is my regular co-host, Colorado State Climatologist, Nolan Duskin. Behind the scenes today running our program are Zach Schwalbe and Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. Today we will look at the flavors of climate variability. You've probably heard the names El Nino, La Nina, uh, the, the, the term jet stream before, and we're going to explore those today. For those of you who are unable to join us with our live broadcast, we'll be recording it for future viewing on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Well, today we're excited to have with us Jerry Bell. Jerry is currently the lead Atlantic hurricane seasonal forecaster at the Climate Prediction Center located at NCEP, which is the National Center for Environmental Prediction in College Park, Maryland. Jerry special, specializes in monthly global climate variability, especially patterns related to the El Nino, the, the multi-decade cycle, and other large-scale atmospheric processes. He is the chief editor and co-author of the Monthly Climate Diagnostics Bulletin. Jerry has received NOAA-wide awards for accurate predictions of both El Nino and seasonal hurricane activity. Welcome, Jerry. It's great to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. And Jerry, this is Nolan Duskin chiming in. I, I just want to uh, reinforce how excited we are to have you on the, on the webinar today. We get so many questions here from people in Colorado and from what they're experiencing locally with large-scale climate drivers and, and factors. And of course, everybody hears about El Nino, but they don't always know exactly what that means. So we're all really looking forward to hearing your talk today. Well, that's great. Uh, it turns out that the, the science of understanding climate variability and patterns like El Nino and La Nina and other large-scale jet stream patterns has just evolved tremendously over the last 20 to 25 years, and our understanding has really, gro really grown, and also it's allowed us to help make better seasonal predictions. So by continually monitoring and trying to better understand and predict these patterns, we can often say something intelligent about first what's going on, and also then to help make a more uh, accurate seasonal predictions, and in some cases make predictions where we just couldn't have before. So the talk for today is, is to discuss some of these different aspects of climate variability. The outline for this talk is to first just distinguish for you between weather, climate, and climate variability, and then uh, focus more from a, a phenomenon, phenomenological type of viewpoint on what is El Nino and La Nina, what are they, and how do they affect the weather patterns. And then we'll talk about climate variability that's linked to recurring jet stream patterns, whereas El Nino and La Nina are really driven by the ocean temperature patterns. You can also get very large-scale recurring jet stream patterns, and they significantly affect our weather. Those patterns are often called teleconnections. There's many different patterns. I'll just focus on three today. You probably heard of the Pacific North American pattern, North Atlantic Oscillation, and also the Arctic Oscillation. So I'll discuss what some of those patterns are and their impacts and then go back to the ocean and look at climate variability that occurs on decadal or multi-decadal cycle, multi-decadal time scales. And these patterns are very important, not only for understanding uh, ocean temperatures and oceanic impacts themselves, but also they can very strongly influence things like, uh, again, the, the jet stream, Atlantic hurricane activity, and so on. And then I'll summarize. So to begin, just to distinguish what is weather from climate, weather is really the short term, the hourly to daily changes that we see in temperature, humidity, precipitation, and so on. Weather is what the TV weatherman talks about. Some examples I just show here in some pictures, thunderstorms, a winter storm, hurricanes, tornadoes, even short term uh, flood events, cold and warm fronts, those types of things, that's all weather. Climate, on the other hand, is the, the average or the slowly varying aspects of the ocean atmosphere system. As, 
examples of climate are like annual mean conditions, uh, the four seasons, the monsoon seasons, hurricane season. Uh, another type of climate is just your average temperature changes throughout the year or even the day-night temperature cycles. And I've got a little graph here just to, to show you what I, I mean by the um, difference between the temperature and climate. This is a, a time series in degrees Celsius indicated on the left and going from January through the end of the year. So it's one full year of temperatures at, at a certain uh, station where we measure temperatures. And the red and blue lines here are the average, are just the average daily temperature throughout the year. The red when the temperature is above the long-term average and blue when the temperature was below the long-term average. The long-term average, or the climate in this case, is this solid curve. That's the average annual daily temperature averaged over 30 years. So you can see it's a much smoother curve. Climate variability then is how do things, how does the climate system vary from this climate signal? And I've indicated here with this brown line indicating in, in this particular spring, summer, and into early fall, it was colder than the long-term average. This wasn't a daily thing, but it was probably linked to, a, in this hypothetical example, to longer-term jet stream patterns. So that's a, an example of climate variability. Climate variability is really the variations in the average state of the climate. Now for this talk, I'm focusing the climate variability on uh, changes in the average state due to natural processes, such as recurring patterns of ocean temperatures, or tropical rainfall patterns, or recurring jet stream patterns. Now this is different, I want to make this distinction here, from climate change where climate change is referring to really the variations in either the mean state of the climate or in its variability, but it's the variability that's attributed directly or indirectly to human activity. And an example would be global warming due to increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. I'm not an expert in that area, and this talk is not about uh, climate change. Instead, it's about the naturally occurring aspects of the climate system and the climate variability. Some basic things about climate variability is that it typically occurs, occurs over vast distances. We're talking continental scale, hemisphere scale, even global. And climate variability can occur over many time scales, ranging from weeks to years to even decades or multiple decades at a time. And as I already mentioned, the, the climate variability that I'm talking about and that we, we see as a dominant, we see it, you know, all the time is the climate variability linked to recurring jet stream patterns, ocean temperature patterns, and tropical rainfall patterns. The climate variability differs throughout the world, as does the climate, and it also differs with the seasons, as does the climate. And just some examples of climate variability. On the left, this is a time series of Atlantic Ocean temperatures from 1900 up to 2000. And what you can see is, for instance, in the 19, through prior to about 1920, the temperatures were below average, indicated by blue. Then they were above average in the 30s through the 60s. Then they dropped to below average, and now continuing, they're, they're warmer than average. This is an example of ocean temperature variability. Called, it's called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, lasting on time scales of multiple decades. We see examples of climate variability in Atlantic hurricane seasons. This is a, a chart showing the strength of the overall strength of the hurricane season from 1950. This particular map was through 2008 or so. And you, where the blue bars point up into the pink area, that shows more activity. And you can see the 1950s and 60s were quite active, and again since 1995. And in contrast, during 1971 and 94, most of the, very few seasons were into the pink area, meaning above normal. So this is another example of multi climate variability occurring on, occurring on multiple decades. Other examples of climate are, are drought or, or very heavy rains for a season. Uh, the 2009-10 record snowfall in the eastern U.S. is an example of climate variability. Uh, El Nino and its impact. So on and on. These are all longer time scale phenomena. They're not day-to-day -day things. They influence the day-to-day -day weather, but they last for, you know, weeks to months to years to decades. So let's focus on the climate variability linked to El Nino and La Nina. Uh, 
or more generally, it's referred to as ENSO, E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation. El Nino and La Nina represent extremes in this El, uh, ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and they are a leading source of year-to-year -year climate variability. They're a tropical phenomenon, tropical Pacific phenomenon, but they affect the global weather patterns. They were discovered actually in stages. Peruvian fishermen used to notice changes in the ocean temperatures off the uh, coast of Peru, and it, they had very significant impact. Those changes had very, very significant impacts on fisheries. From a meteorological perspective, so Sir Gilbert Walker in the 1920s noted these global scale pressure patterns that extended across the whole Pacific Basin and linked them up with Pacific Ocean temperatures. But there was still a lot of understanding that, that needed to be done, and Jacob Bierknings back in the 1960s was the one to really link up a, a lot of the Pacific Ocean types of impacts with mid-latitude weather patterns, such as weather patterns in the U.S. And then since the 1980s, since the record 82-83 El Nino, that's when the, the Weather Service and, and climate people really began in earnest studying these phenomenon, and then now we now we monitor them routinely and, and predict them El Nino, La Nina all the time, and they're just fundamental to seasonal predictions of virtually anything for the United States. Again, El Nino and La Nina are related to changes in tropical Pacific Ocean temperatures. They occur roughly every three to five years, and they typically last about nine to twelve months. <clears throat> I'm sure you all know El Nino is a warming of the an anomalous warming of the central and eastern equatorial Pacific, and La Nina, its counterpart, refers to a cooling of the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. We, NOAA classifies El Nino and La Nina episode, episodes using what's called the Oceanic Nino Index, or ONI. ONI. It's a very simple measure. It's just the three-month running mean of the sea surface temperature departures in what's called the Nino 3.4 region. That's that red box there. We, we have weekly temperatures in this region. We, we look at them all the time, and when you average them all up, you come up with this ONI index, and that gives you a historical measure of when El Nino and La Nina occurred. And on the right is the time series of that ONI index uh, by month from 1950 through 70 at the top and then through the end of 2012. And the El Nino and La Nina episodes are where that index is, is quite warm for some time, for instance, 57, 58. And then where it was quite cool, you see the La Nina episodes. I just, hold on, I just did something. There we go. So anyway, there's, there's a historical index of El Nino and La Nina episodes, and you can see they, they occur uh, you know, at roughly every three to five years or so. Sometimes they last about a year. Sometimes you get a longer-term event that lasts for a couple of years or even three years. We have an extensive monitoring and prediction capability of El Nino and La Nina at the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, the top is the, the link to that. We, we continuously update the current conditions on these phenomena. There's a lot of historical information. There's uh, We have a weekly uh, product that's updated every Monday morning that shows the latest status of all the relevant atmospheric and oceanic fields throughout the global tropics, and we discuss the state of El Nino and La Nina there. There's also a monthly diagnostics discussion that includes our, our updated monthly forecast. There's an extensive La Nina and El Nino tutorial. And there's also a lot of uh, things out there for, for you if you're wondering what the impacts are and your state or things like that. You, we have the temperature, rainfall, and snow impacts by season for many different locations. We also show how your temperature distributions might vary for, for uh, given climate divisions. And uh, again, the model forecast, we make the El Nino, or we make the ENSO forecast based on a whole suite of computer models, many of which are, are only you know, less than 10 years old. And there's also an official probability forecast that we give for El Nino. So the goal isn't to, to discuss all of these now, but just to let, make you aware that there's an extensive monitoring predicting capability that you can look at on your own. To understand El Nino and La Nina, it's paramount to first look at what the normal patterns of ocean temperatures are. So these are the normal ocean temperatures during January. And the reds indicate where the temperatures are quite warm. 
and the blues are where they're cooler. So you see two things. If you look at focus on the Pacific Basin, generally the waters are warmest in the Western Pacific, and that's also where the heaviest tropical rainfall is. You know, you think of Indonesia and the Asian monsoon region. So typically in the Western Pacific, it's warm and wet. And in the Eastern Pacific, the water temperatures are, are quite a bit cooler. And also, it's, it's, you generally don't see much in the way of tropical rainfall over the eastern half of the Pacific Basin. So if you look at the scale of this temperature pattern, this dipole pattern, you can see that it spans roughly a third to even almost halfway around the globe. So these are very large scale patterns. This is a map. The top panel just shows the exact same temperature pattern you just saw, the normal January conditions. And the bottom left shows the ocean temperature patterns during strong El Nino. This was the 97, 98 El Nino. And you see that the waters across the eastern half of the tropical Pacific have warmed considerably. Instead of being around 25 or 26 degrees Celsius, they're 29 and 30 degrees Celsius. The temperature departure pattern shows on the, is on the right. So you see this extensive anomalous warming east of the dateline. That's, that's El Nino. In contrast, to, uh, we have La Nina now, the, the same pattern of normal ocean temperatures at the top. With La Nina, that equatorial, it's cooler in that region of the equatorial cold tongue. The main body of warm water is really confined back west of the dateline to the western Pacific and Indonesia region. And if you look at the temperature departures from normal for this La Nina, you can see that the waters were quite a bit cooler across the central and east central equatorial Pacific. So that's what La Nina looks like in an ocean temperature map. Now, El Nino and La Nina are a tropical Pacific phenomenon, but they significantly impact the weather throughout the globe. And here's why. The, uh, the, the shading in these panels on the left shows for a strong El Nino, it shows the patterns of wintertime tropical rainfall uh, in, in, for that case. And what you see is that where that water was warmer than average, you also had significantly wetter than average conditions. And in the meantime, Indonesia was much drier than average. In fact, they were in an area where you normally had heavy rains. They do a lot of slash and burn agriculture there. They weren't getting the rains. That slash and burn was burning, and there was no way to put the fires out in this particular event. La Nina is the opposite. When the warm water is retracted westward, so is the heavy tropical rainfall. And you tend to have virtually no rainfall or very little east of the dateline. The scale of these patterns is more than a third of the way around the globe. So again, the, these impacts are very large. Now they, it turns out that the tropical rainfall patterns very strongly control the Pacific jet stream. The jet stream is important because that's what controls our, our weather patterns, the storm tracks, where the storms form, where they move, and so on. So tropical rainfall patterns, by changing them with El Nino and La Nina, that directly changes the jet stream. For example, the yellow arrow I've shown here is the normal uh, called Pacific or East Asian jet stream. Typically, it comes off of uh, near southern Japan and expense, extends about to eastward to about the dateline. During El Nino, the warm water extends eastward, the tropical rainfall extends eastward, so does the Pacific jet stream, which then puts the western United States right in the heart of the region of the strongest jet stream winds and also the regions of very strong winter storminess. In contrast, during La Nina, with the rainfall and warm ocean temperatures retracted westward toward Indonesia, so is the jet Pacific jet stream retracted back toward Asia. So these are fundamentally different jet stream patterns. And as a result, El Nino and La Nina also impact the weather patterns, not only in the tropics, but across the entire North Pacific and the Americas. They do a similar thing in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm just focusing on the, the, the Northern Hemisphere for these, these uh, schematics. This is a, you probably all seen two similar types of things. These are the global El Nino temperature and precipitation impacts. The top panel shows the impacts during our winter, December through March, and the bottom shows it June through August. And what we typically see is not only is El Nino and also La Nina strongest in winter, but that's when the, in the winter hemisphere is when they have their strongest impacts. Uh, 
again, not to go, not to feel a need to go through all of these, but you see the warmer and wetter conditions with El Nino, drier across the western part of the Pacific Basin, warmer into, into the uh, western North America, wetter and stormier and cooler across the south with that jet stream winds pattern and so on. And you see similar types of impacts in South America. And then in June through August, the tropical pattern is still persisting. But you see that the, the northern hemisphere really doesn't have much in the way of impacts. They really shift more and focus in the southern hemisphere, which is the winter hemisphere during June through August. So El Nino impacts include these the temp very large scale temperature and rainfall patterns for months at a time, jet streams and storm tracks. Also, monsoon rainfalls and rainfall and hurricanes. What you see is, in general, opposite types of, of temperature and rainfall anomalies during La Nina. And of course, that's consistent with the opposite pattern of, of cooler and drier in the eastern tropical Pacific, wetter in the western Pacific. And you see then much cooler than average conditions up through Alaska and western North America stormier than average conditions into the Pacific Northwest, and much drier conditions across the south, whereas El Nino it's much stormier, now with La Nina it's much drier. Here's a zoom in of the patterns over North America that we typically see with El Nino. As I mentioned, the, the Pacific jet stream is the key link between the tropics and our weather patterns. With El Nino, that Pacific or East Asian jet stream, extends all, all the way across the basin and then comes into the southern United, across the southern United States. Normally, if you follow my cursor here, the jet stream heads up toward the Gulf of Alaska and then kind of comes in in the Pacific Northwest. This is a dramatic southward shift in the mean position of the jet stream and the associated storm track. As a result, the southern part of the country is wetter and stormier. The northern part of the country is warmer and drier because the storminess and so on has shifted south. You see an opposite type of pattern with La Nina. With La Nina you have a much more variable jet stream and that Pacific jet stream as I mentioned is retracted way back toward more toward Asia. So what you see is sometimes when that jet is retracted, retracted back toward Asia then it will head, <clears throat> instead of heading up into the Gulf of Alaska it heads way up toward Alaska and then comes down into North America. So that is, certainly promotes cold air outbreaks. What you see is with more variability then sometimes that jet stream will then extend eastward and then you might have the storms coming into western North America. So you get this pattern that flops between the jet stream being way north and much more variable or it retracted westward or even extending into the Pacific Northwest. And as a result you get these, these really coherent and recurring patterns that we see. So the important thing about this is that when you look at the weather patterns, you might say, well, gee, it's, it's in this case warmer across the south, wetter in the Pacific Northwest. We're seeing a lot of cold air coming in. And 30 years ago, nobody would have recognized that, oh, this is linked to this climate phenomenon called La Nina. Similar type of argument with El Nino. So El Nino and La I mean, you're very important from a prediction viewpoint because once you can predict that phenomenon, you can then say something intelligent about the, the nature of the upcoming winter weather, not only in one location, but across much of North America. And as I mentioned, other, other areas quite distant from us. So you get these coherent global scale patterns that are really linked to the, the same phenomenon. So establishing that causality is very, very important from an understanding and from a predicting perspective. I mentioned El Nino and La Nina affect the hurricane seasons. This is a, a schematic that I put together of, of how they do it. Um, the reds indicate for El Nino, so for instance, the eastern and central Pacific hurricane regions, El Nino tends to favor more hurricanes, where in the Atlantic, El Nino favors less hurricanes. It tends to suppress the activity. La Nina is vice versa. And then there's not much change. They don't really affect hurricanes over the Indian Ocean, the North or South Indian Ocean. They have impacts on the Western Pacific because you're directly affecting those ocean temperatures. And they also impact the hurricanes in around the Australian uh, hurricane region. <clears throat> 
So shifting now from climate variability that's directly linked to changes in ocean temperatures, I want to focus on climate variability that's linked to recurring jet stream patterns. Now, as we already saw, and these are called teleconnections, these recurring jet stream patterns. Now, we already saw El Nino and La Nina can affect the jet stream. Hence, they, do, they are a source of recurring jet stream patterns. But there's a lot of jet stream variability that we see that is not linked to El Nino and La Nina. So these recurring jet stream patterns, as I mentioned, are another very important source of climate variability. The jet streams, as, as, as you well know, are, are rivers of strong winds at about 30,000, 35,000 feet altitude. They're very important because they control where the storms form, the strength of the storms, where the storms track, and so on. Uh, they're associated with very large pressure pattern, air pressure patterns, wind and storminess patterns, and so on. And a lot of climate variability is linked to these recurring jet stream patterns. And as what we see is that, as with El Nino, where you had a tropical Pacific phenomenon, but you had these impacts far, far away from the Pacific, the jet stream teleconnections have a similar thing. You would, with an anomalous jet stream pattern, it can affect temperature and rainfall and storm tracks over vast distances, across entire ocean basins or across the continent. So to understand this concept, it's really worthwhile to go through uh, some, some basic wind and air pressure relationships. And the top shows for a tip high pressure system, as you know, the winds flow clockwise around a high pressure system. They found flow counterclockwise around a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere. With those wind patterns, there are certain temperature and, and rainfall patterns. When the winds are out of the south, obviously it's warmer. When they're out of the north, it's colder. Typically, high pressure systems are associated with clearer weather as well. With low pressure systems, you tend to have warmer and wetter conditions out ahead of the low pressure, colder and drier behind it. And also, the conditions are stormier. Jet stream pattern, jets, the jet stream is associated with a very specific pressure pattern. And here I've shown a schematic. These lines are lines of equal pressure. And I've drawn a jet stream. North of the jet stream is lower pressure. South of the jet stream is higher pressure. And this is looking more in the upper atmosphere. Downstream of that jet stream pattern, you have a reverse dipole of pressure. You have higher pressure to the north, lower pressure to the south. So what you see is jet streams are associated with this four cell pressure pattern. It's, it's dynamically required or you wouldn't have the jet stream, basically. And you see that the pressure pattern, this four cell pattern, extends far beyond the jet stream itself. So change, when you have changes in the jet stream position and strength, they're associated with very large scale air pressure patterns. There's also a very specific pattern of wet and dry that's associated with a jet stream. I again indicated the pressure lines and the jet stream. In the jet entrance region, it's called upstream of the jet core. You tend to have drier to the north and wetter to the south. And you have an opposite pattern downstream of the jet core. This wetter area that I'm circling is the area where storms tend to form, as I've indicated down below. Storms tend to form in this left exit region or the cyclonic shear side of the jet stream, and they tend to decay as, as, as disturbances move into the jet stream and get sheared off and become more a jet stream structure. So the jet streams, again, the scale of these patterns is far beyond that of the jet stream itself. If you just connect those three pa patterns, this looks like a lot, but I've simply indicated exactly what we what I already showed. This is when you have an anomalous jet stream, these are these are the coherent patterns of temperature, rainfall, storminess, and so on that you see. So what you see is what you might think, oh my gosh, what's going on with the wacky weather? That could simply be a jet stream re uh, related teleconnection pattern that may be causing stormier and wetter conditions in one area, cooler and drier conditions in another, and so on. So again, the scale of these patterns is really worth noting. So now let's look at two dominant jet streams. We have two dominant jet streams in North America. This is the average winter air pressure pattern that I'm showing at jet stream level. These dots, they were the same as my lines before. There's the Pacific jet stream that I already mentioned, and there's the Atlantic jet stream. 
It comes off of the eastern U.S. and heads over toward Europe. Generally, it heads up toward Great Britain. If you look at those pressure contours with these jet streams, they're identical to what I just drew already. Low and high pressures, reversing patterns as you, if, as you get uh, further east of the jet stream, and so on. So these are two dominant jet stream patterns. And again, the scale of these jet streams is very important. They're not just the scale of, of a small region, the scale of half the Pacific Basin or North America extending to Europe, very large scale jet stream patterns. And it turns out that fluctuations in the strength and location of these two jet streams produce several teleconnection patterns, several different ones that we monitor routinely that affect conditions across the North Pacific, North America, the North Atlantic, and, and Eurasia. We already saw some of these impacts on the Pacific jet stream with El Nino and La Nina. We have an extensive monitoring program for these jet stream or these teleconnection patterns at Climate Prediction Center. On the left here are some of the main uh, teleconnection patterns and their names. On this website, you can click on a particular pattern and see what, how it affects the air pressure across the northern hemisphere, also the temperature and rainfall patterns. So you can look and see what, what patterns affect your area of interest. There are also uh, re more recent time series of these patterns uh, showing index values of the different phases of these patterns. There's also a historical time series dating back to 1950. So there's a lot out there on the internet that you can take a look at on your own. There's also, for a couple of the dominant patterns, the Arctic Oscillation, and I'll go through these in a minute, the Arctic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation, and Pacific North American pattern, as well as the, there's an Antarctic Oscillation, but which is centered over Antarctica. We look at these, we have model forecasts of these patterns day by day. And there's various measures of what the model forecasts of these, of these patterns are doing from daily to seven-day forecast to 10-day forecast out to 14-day forecast. And you can look and see what the model forecasts are and their skill. So just to go back to this pattern we already saw, the two main jet stream patterns, let's focus on the one over the Pacific first. It's the Pacific North American pattern. And this El Nino and La Nina, this is the Pacific North American pattern on the left. The shading shows the pressure pattern. So with this, pot, it's called the positive phase of this PNA pattern. They have positive and a negative phase, all these patterns, and then it allows us to monitor where we are with that pattern. And also its strength, how strong is it in a given phase. With this phase of the PNA pattern, the jet, Pacific jet stream is extended across the Pacific. There's lower pressure to the north, higher pressure to the south. And then there's the reverse pattern of anomalies over North America. So the scale of this pressure pattern basically extends from Asia all the way into the Western Atlantic. Very large scale pattern. This has similar area to the similarity to the pattern that El Nino produces. El Nino is one cause of this pattern, but also just the natural jet stream variability will produce this pattern as well. It's a recurring pattern. Sometimes it's linked to the tropical rainfall patterns and ocean temperature patterns. Sometimes it's on its, on its own. It's natural, very naturally occurring part of the climate system. With the positive phase of the PNA pattern, you can see this, this grayish shade and brownish shading area. This pattern when the jet stream extends eastward, so does the region of storm formation. So with this pattern, we have much more active in the eastern Pacific regarding storm formation. And once the storms form directly upstream of us, they have very little place to go except into North America. So you have a much stormier pattern in North America as a result of this pattern. The opposite phase is what we saw with La Nina, where the Pacific jet stream is retracted back toward Asia. The region of storminess is also retracted back toward Asia. And you see an opposite pattern in the reds and blues, opposite pressure anomaly patterns with this. Again, this is a pattern that La Nina produces, but it also can occur on its own. And you see with this pattern, with the jet stream heading up toward Alaska and then coming down into the western U.S., it's a much colder type of pattern for the United States. This shows just the different aspects, different impacts that I mentioned with the Pacific North America pattern. The columns on the left are for January, and on the right they're for July. 
So the top shows just the correlations with surface air pressure. You already saw this anomaly pattern, but you can see it's strongly related to pressure patterns across the Pacific and North America. And in the middle, you show the correlations with surface temperature, where the positive phase is associated with much warmer and milder conditions in the, in the, the eastern Pacific and up into North America. And the cooler and with the um, negative phase, you see near average or below average temperatures into, into Canada. And also milder, you see a difference in the temperature patterns across the south. And again, there you see the corresponding rainfall patterns associated with these they, they differ quite a bit over North America. This is the negative phase of the pattern showing the similar air pressure patterns. With the negative phase, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The, the surface temperature patterns here were for July. You don't see much of a temperature impact compared to the winter. The PNA has its biggest impacts in winter. That's when the pattern tends, pattern tends to be strongest and have its biggest impacts on the weather. You see opposite temperature and precipitation patterns for the negative phase of the PNA, much cooler than average conditions across Alaska and into Canada, certainly favors more cold air outbreaks into the northwestern United States and so on. And also you see quite different precipitation patterns, a lot wetter conditions in the Pacific Northwest and in the eastern United States. This is a time series by month of the PNA pattern, and where the, P, where the values are blue, that's, it's a negative phase, that's that negative phase we were talking about, and where they're red, that's the positive phase of the pattern. And you see a couple of things here. There's a lot of variability in this pattern. Sometimes the pattern lasts for, for a few months, sometimes it can last for a year or more. It just really depends. So this PNA pattern varies from weeks to months to years, and it's a main source of climate variability, not only across the Pacific Ocean, but also North America. Focused variability from the eastern U.S. all the way to Europe, it's called the North Atlantic Oscillation. And the North Atlantic Oscillation is related to north-south fluctuations in the Atlantic jet stream. On the top left, I'm showing for the positive phase or the north of the North Atlantic Oscillation. And in this phase, let me get my cursor back here, the Atlantic jet stream tends to be further north, like we've had so far this winter over the eastern U.S., and then it extends up toward northern Europe. With that pattern, we have much milder than average conditions across the southeastern and eastern U.S. It tends to keep the cold air more trapped up into Canada. And also with the jet stream heading up toward Great Britain, northern, New northern Europe tends to be warmer and wetter than average, southern Europe colder and drier than average. So again, here you've got coherent temperature and rainfall patterns extending from North America all the way to Europe. The negative phase of the, nor of the North Atlantic Oscillation is a much colder pattern for the eastern U.S. During this pattern, the, in this position of the Atlantic jet stream. The jet is much further south. It, it exits uh, North America down near Virginia. And then it, it extends roughly straight across to southern Europe. As, it, as a result, southern Europe tends to be much stormier, warmer, and wetter because you've got a good flux of mild marine air into the southern part of Europe. And northern Europe tends to be colder than drier, colder and drier than average. On the right, you see the, let me just try and remove this, now. the wintertime NAO index, and you see that this pattern, not only is, this shows the wintertime pattern by year, not only is there a lot of year-to-year -year variability, but this pattern tends to latch on for decades at a time. During the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, and many from the eastern half of the country would say, yeah, I remember back then, winters were stormier and colder and, and all sorts of stuff. Well, that was part because we were locked into this negative phase or cold phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Since about 1990, since about 1980, we've had predominantly the positive or those, this warmer phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, and winter weather, has, winter has been much milder across the eastern half of the country.
The bottom map shows a time series of the NAO index dating back to, 19, back to 1860, much longer time scale pattern. And you can see, again, there's a lot of variability year to year, but also you see where this pattern can latch on for, for a decade or decades at a time, and hence produce these periods of, of colder winters or, or warmer winters, winters, depending on the phase of the NAO. This shows the uh, correlations with the uh, NAO during January on the left and July, just like we had for the Pacific North American pattern. And you can see the pressure pattern correlations, again, are, are very, quite extensive. <clears throat> the middle panel shows the correlations with surface temperature, and you can see these large-scale patterns from eastern North America all the way well into, into western Russia. The pattern, again, tends to be, is, tends to be most dominant in winter when the NAO or the wintertime jet stream is strongest. And the, the NAO pattern, while it's still there in summer, it's not nearly as an extensive and, and as powerful a pattern as you have in winter. And then in the bottom you see the correlations with, with precipitation again, very large scale patterns extending across North America and the Atlantic Basin and into Europe. And uh, same for the negative phase, not to go through these, but they're the opposite temperature patterns. So you can see, for instance, with this negative phase that we saw in the 50s and 60s, much colder than average conditions across the southern U.S., and you see an opposite pattern of temperature departures across Europe. And then with uh, the same phase, much stormier and wetter across southern Europe, drier across the north. So again, by, when you look at these temperature and rainfall patterns, if you don't really look at this large scale picture, you might think just something is happening regionally. And when you look at these larger scale patterns, you say, oh, wait a minute, that's this anomalous uh, Atlantic jet stream pattern. It's affecting everything from eastern North America to Europe with this big teleconnection pattern. So it, it goes back to causality in that if you can then predict the NAO to some, ex set, to some extent, then in theory you'd be able to say something more intelligent about the winter weather patterns than, than if, if you didn't even know about it. One of the important issues with predicting seasonal patterns and understanding these patterns is, is understanding combinations of these patterns. We saw that El Nino affects North America. We saw that the NAO affects North America. Well, sometimes these two phenomena may be acting to reinforce each other, the temperature and rainfall patterns. Sometimes, depending on their phase, they may be acting to offset each other. And this is just an example of, of that. The top panel shows the wintertime average temperature departures for, for El Nino. And you can see a mild, milder across North America, uh, across Canada and the northern part of the U.S., and cooler across the south, typical pattern we already saw. When you're in a cold phase of the NAO, the negative phase of the NAO, that favors colder across eastern North America, look how that temperature pattern has changed. Eastern North America tends to be much colder. And you see the opposite when you have El Nino and the positive phase of the NAO at the bottom, both tending to want to make North America warmer. You see a much more extensive pattern of warming. So when we're trying to make a prediction, seasonal prediction, you really need to know something about the NAO if you're going to have as accurate a prediction as you can. Now it turns out because, for instance, in East, the mid, let's just pick the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, those temperatures, if the NA, given El Nino, let's pretend we have an El Nino, the temperatures in the eastern US, United States can really vary, can be quite different depending on the phase of the NAO. So if we don't have any skill for predicting the seasonal NAO, which we don't, then when we're trying to make a seasonal prediction, we would say, well, it, there really isn't a systematic El Nino signal in, in, say, the eastern U.S. because there's other phenomena, such as the NAO, that really more strongly control those patterns. And if you can't predict the NAO on a seasonal time scale, you, you, you can't say something about, about the temperature patterns in that region. The NAO is, is a bane to seasonal predictions. Uh, 
continues to be because we just don't have the skill, the climate models, the skill to predict these various fluctuations in the north-south positions of the Atlantic jet stream. There's a third teleconnection pattern. It's called the Arctic Oscillation. And that really contains aspects of both the PNA and the NAO patterns. So it's, it's what kind of you see when you've got anomalous uh, jet stream patterns across the Pacific and the Atlantic Basin. And I've indicated here uh, with the positive phase of the uh, Arctic Oscillation, you tend to have a much weaker Aleutian low, much stronger Icelandic low, and the jet stream pattern I've, I've indicated in red, and you can see how the, the, the jet stream patterns are quite different between those two. Of course, since the Arctic Oscillation contains these jet stream patterns that we already saw, it also affects the winter across North America. On the left is, a, is the time series uh, of the AO back to 1950. And you can see there's a lot of variability in this pattern. But again, because it's similar with the NAO, it can last sometimes for years at a time. Or sometimes even, you know, here, here's from 1988 to 1993, there's a five-year pattern in its positive phase. The positive phase is associated with much milder than average conditions across the eastern half of North America. The negative phase, like the negative phase of the NAO, is associated with cooler than average conditions. For instance, look back in the 1950s and 60s, you see a lot more blue than you do red. That was that cold period that we had that I already mentioned. Let's now go back. I mentioned the NAO and the Arctic Oscillation and that they, can, they vary from weeks to months to years to even decades. There's two other patterns of climate variability that also last for decades. These are ocean temperature patterns. One is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, and it's called that because it lasts for decades. Another one is a Pacific decadal oscillation, or the PDO. The PDO was just discovered in 1996. The Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, let's focus on the Atlantic first, is a, so right now we're in the, what's called the warm phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. And the top panel shows what the temperature departures look like in this warm phase. You have much warmer than average conditions across the, let me get my cursor back, across the tropical Atlantic, and also at the high latitudes across the whole northern North Atlantic. The negative phase, or the cold phase of the AMO is associated with opposite temperature departures. The bottom shows a time series of this AMO dating back to about 1870. And you see these long period changes. The AMO was in its warm phase in the 1880s and 90s. Then the Atlantic was much colder during the 1900 to 1920, warmer than average from the 30s through the 60s, and then it dropped back colder, and now it's warm again, uh, well, through, through now. We're now 17 years into the warm phase of the AMO. Which began again in, in 19, which began in 1995. This pattern typically occurs on timescales of anywhere from 25 to 40 years. One of the reasons it's very important is not only for, for fisheries and, and coastal temperatures, but also for predicting Atlantic hurricane activity. It has significant impacts on the Atlantic hurricane season. This pattern was discovered back in 1920 by Sir Gilbert Walker, and now we know that it's associated with large-scale changes in strength of the Indian monsoon, the West African monsoon, and also Atlantic hurricane activity, as I mentioned. We can see some of these patterns. The top here shows that same AMO index that we just saw, but this is just going back to 1900. The middle panel shows a time series of rainfall in the, the heart of the Indian monsoon region that I've indicated at the right for this green area. It's the area average rainfall dating back to 1900. And you can see that Indian rainfall tends to be below average, blue, during the cold phase of the AMO, above average, reds during the warm phase, and, and that pattern continues. Obviously, the AMO isn't the only factor affecting the Indian monsoon, but it, it can be a big player. 
The AMO is also associated with changes in the West African monsoon, this green area that I've indicated on the bottom right panel. When the AMO is in its cold phase, the West African monsoon tends to be drier, indicated by blue. When the AMO is in its warm phase, the Indian, uh, West African monsoon is wetter and, and similar. You might recall during the 70s and 80s, there was horrible drought in the Western Africa, African Sahel, and Sudan regions, they're called. That coincided right with the, AM, the cold phase of the AMO index. You don't hear about that drought anymore because it's not a drought anymore. We switched to the warm phase of the AMO, and the West African rains have come back. They've been above average since 1995. The left-hand panel kind of highlights this link between the tropical rainfall patterns and the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. This is the pattern that we've seen since 1995, warmer in the tropical and high latitudes of the Atlantic, wetter in the West African monsoon region, and also drier across the, the eastern part of the Amazon basin. If you look at, let me get my cursor back here. There it goes. Right in this area is the tropical Atlantic. When you have a monsoon circulation, the winds extend far beyond the, the West African monsoon region. They extend outward to the southern hemisphere and also right across the basin. So this warm phase of this AMO, by directly affecting the West African monsoon, it then directly affects the hurricane activity by altering the winds. It does, though, in a certain way. This phase of the AMO is associated with increased Atlantic hurricane activity. And since 1995, we've been, a, in, we've been seeing a lot of hurricane activity, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, high activity era. This chart at the right, I, I mentioned it earlier, but this is the measure of the seasonal hurricane season strength by year. And where the blue bar extends up into the pink area, that would be considered an above normal season. Where it stays down in the blue shading, that would be a below normal season. And you see that with the warm phase of the AMO during the 50s and 60s, and also again since 95, we see a lot of Atlantic hurricane activity during the cold phase of the AMO, suppressed rainfall in the African monsoon region, you have very little hurricane activity. For instance, from 71 to 94, there were only three above normal seasons in 25 years. Now we've had something like 12 12 above normal seasons in the last 17 years or something like that. So the, this is a long-term climate pattern that has direct impacts on things like the hurricane activity, which, which of course directly affect the United States, as we saw this year, significantly. So here again, by understanding these, these teleconnection patterns or these global climate patterns, we can then make predictions, oftentimes accurate predictions, in this case about the strength of the upcoming hurricane season. Uh, because, for instance, we know this pattern lasts 25 to 40 years. There's no indication it's ended. Every indication it's still going on. So we remain in this threat of, for increased Atlantic hurricane activity, perhaps for another decade or more to come. Another pattern that I'll just mention briefly, you may have heard of, is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This is a Pacific Ocean temperature pattern that can last for decades at a time. It tends not to be so locked in as the AMO, but it still can persist for, for you know, 10, 20 years at a time. This pattern, in its positive phase, tends to be associated with warmer than average ocean temperatures, indicated by the shading, across the eastern and central equatorial Pacific, and much colder than average conditions across the high latitudes of the North Pacific. So here's an example, again, where if this pattern, while this pattern is in place, if you have El Nino, it can tend to reinforce the impacts from El Nino or the strength of El Nino. Its negative phase is associated with opposite temperature patterns, which would tend to offset El Nino or in, or reinforce perhaps the strength of a particular La Nina episode. And the time series at the bottom shows the strength of this PDO. Uh, and you, again, you can see there's, while there's a lot of variability, you still get these long periods of it being in one phase or another. This pattern was only discovered recently by a fishery scientist, Stephen Hare, who was studying uh, 
uh, ocean temperature patterns and, and impacts on salmon fisheries. Now the meteorologists have really jumped on it and we see that uh, of course because of the scale of these temperature patterns, not only in space but in time, it can very strongly impact the weather and, and, and also help to modulate the strength of El Nino and La Nina. So in summary then, we've talked about climate variability on different space and time scales and also on different forcing, different forcings related to it. Some are related to changes in ocean temperatures, El Nino and La Nina. They have global impacts. They tend to last anywhere from about 9 to 12 months. They tend to be strongest in winter and the strongest impacts tend to be during the winter hemisphere. Understanding El Nino and La Nina are, is the primary, that is our first order predictive signal for seasonal predictions. Another pattern, ocean temperature pattern is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. It's that Atlantic temperature pattern lasts for decades at a time. This is a prominent pattern that I use when I'm making the seasonal hurricane forecast in addition to El Nino and La Nina because a lot of your predictive skill is not come again from understanding these patterns independently but understanding are they going to reinforce each other or offset each other and then use that to help make your seasonal prediction. A third pattern I mentioned was the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And then it focused on climate variability linked to the recurring jet stream patterns. Sometimes these jet stream patterns can be linked up to the tropics with El Nino and La Nina. Sometimes they can just occur, they just occur naturally. There doesn't seem to be any tropical forcing of the patterns. And we saw that because of the scale of these jet stream patterns, but really because of the scale of the temperature, rainfall, and storm track and pressure patterns associated with a given jet stream, when you have an anomalous jet stream pattern, you have anomalous temperature patterns and so on, on scales of continental scale or across ocean basins. These are very seasonally dependent patterns. They tend to be strongest in winter with the wintertime jet streams. And as we saw, they can vary from months, even weeks, to seasons, to decades, we saw with the North Atlantic Oscillation. The Arctic Oscillation is a similar type of pattern, but it's more of a hemispheric scale pattern. It's associated with changes in both the Atlantic and Pacific jet stream. And when this pattern is in place, you can see anomalous temperature and precipitation patterns across the entire northern hemisphere. Again, it's the what's going on with the wacky weather. It oftentimes can be linked to these recurring jet stream patterns or teleconnection patterns. And as I mentioned a couple of times, being able to predict these patterns, but more importantly, they're combinations of conditions, how they may offset each other or how they may reinforce each other is really at the heart of making seasonal predictions. When we cannot make a prediction for the NAO, for instance, in winter, that, is, that, then, lead, that then represents a direct source of uncertainty in the seasonal prediction and it reduces the confidence in prediction. Sometimes it means you can't make a prediction in certain areas based on El Nino because you can't pr properly predict the phase of the NAO. So anyway, I'll stop there and be glad to take some questions. Jerry, thank you very much. Wow, that, that's a lot, a lot of great information there, um, stuff that probably a lot of folks hadn't thought about, and uh, we, we appreciate that. We're going we're gonna to ask you if you could send us those links uh, to some of those uh, sites that you had. We'll post those on our website. We've also recorded this webinar, and uh, those of you out there that are, that are listening right now, uh, I'm sure you'll want to go back and, and go over some of these subjects again. Very, very interesting. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, and if you do have a question for Jerry, type it in right now. We'll try to uh, get as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. If not, Jerry will be glad to follow up with you via email afterwards. Here's an interesting one. Uh, 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 Paul writes, what causes the fluctuation in sea surface, temperature, sea surface temperatures, and he wanted to know if it could be related to sunspot activity. That's a good question. Um, we don't see much of a relationship between sunspots and these, these leading climate patterns. They, they tend to be more associated with the internal ocean or atmospheric variability or combination of them both. El Nino and La Nina really are a coupled ocean-atmosphere phenomenon. 
meaning that you can you don't just get warmer waters in the Pacific for no reason. You tend to have the trade for El Nino, the trade winds weaken, that produces reduced upwelling. Upwelling is bringing up cold water from the subsurface. When it's reduced, you have warmer water. Warmer water affects the tropical rainfall. That further affects the winds. And so you, the ocean atmosphere system together goes into this state we call El Nino and vice versa for La Nina. Now for the multi-decadal patterns, the North Atlantic oscillation is related to longer term changes in what's called the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. That's the big ocean gyre, the big anticyclonic gyre of the ocean current that we have in the Atlantic Basin. Sometimes that, that gyre is stronger than average, sometimes it's weaker than average. And that appears to be the ultimate, ultimately the source of and locking in the long time scale, this decadal scale uh, of the North Atlantic Oscillation because that turns out that's what the thermohaline circulation, the time scales that it operates at. Thanks, Jerry. Here's one from Tom in Colorado. He wants to know what do the various indices tell us about the rest of the winter and early spring in the U.S.? Well, in general, the teleconnection intersection patterns that I mentioned a couple times regarding the NAO. Our main predictability for those patterns comes about with predicting El Nino and La Nina. Oftentimes we have high predictability for El Nino and La Nina. Right now we're in ENSO neutral conditions. There's no El Nino or La Nina. Uh, and quite frankly, we thought we were going to go to an El Nino this winter and didn't. So that was a that was a, a bust. All the models were predicting El Nino to develop and it, and it didn't. I, I still don't know why it didn't. I think it was because the trade winds remained stronger than average, and unless they weaken, you just can't get us into this El Nino state and maintain those warmer waters. Um, so as far as the spring goes, really more of what conditions you'd expect more climatologically because you don't have an El Nino or La Nina. And that means variability in the winter weather patterns and so on. Now as we get into spring, we'll be looking at very closely how the conditions are, are evolving, especially with El Nino and La Nina, or then so, because that's very important information that I need to make the seasonal hurricane outlook that comes uh, in later in May. Thanks, Jerry. Here's one from Dan. Well, he wants to know, is there any data indicating that our jet streams have slowed or excelled in the past 30 years uh, for a consistent number of years? You know, I don't focus on that a lot. Uh, with the phase of the NAO, we, I, I think in terms of looking at a, a hemispheric type of thing, you really need to focus on the individual jet streams themselves. And with the NAO, we saw the, the cold phase of the NAO was during the 50s and 60s. And more importantly than the strength of the jet is its location. When that jet stream, let me just go back here to the bottom left panel. <clears throat> when the Atlantic jet stream is more east to west, you tend to have a lot of high latitude blocking. That tends to bring a lot of colder, drier air into northern Europe. And when you have a pattern that lasts for a month, let alone 20 or 30 years, that's a source of cooling for all of northern Eurasia. Vice versa, southern Europe tends to be milder and wetter. Now in the, in the opposite phase with the Atlantic jet stream, again, it's not so much the strength, but it's its orientation. In the positive phase, like we've been seeing since 1980, that structure of the Atlantic jet stream is pumping mild marine air into northern Europe which then, on a time scale of a few weeks, goes across Asia. So with this pattern, really all of northern uh, Europe and Eurasia tends to be quite milder, which they have been. So these orientations of the, of the jet stream are really critical as far as understanding the northward uh, heat transport, heat moisture transport, and then understanding for patterns that last for decades at a time. Now the Pacific jet stream, as I mentioned, is, has a lot of variability, but that's more year to year. Uh, it can be linked up with El Nino and La Nina sometimes. Uh, and so the difference in the strength is really, let me go here, 
with the positive phase of the PNA pattern, you have a much more extensive Pacific jet stream. Remember, the jet stream normally only comes out to about the dateline. So this is, in this positive phase, is a pronounced eastward extension of the jet. So yeah, overall, the jet stream is much stronger than average. And in the negative phase, the overall jet stream is much weaker than average when you look across the Pacific Basin. Here's one from, from Jim in Maine. He wants to know, do models like the GFS and the European model take the NAO and PNA into account? Yes, they do. In fact, one of the things we monitor routinely is not only these patterns, but how the models are predicting them. And it turns out that after about four or five days, you're really getting into iffy as far as, as, far as predictive skill. If you have a very persistent pattern, the, t the models tend to be better at predicting it. But if you have a, a, a pattern that's changing rapidly, uh, the, the model may blow it after three or four days. And so that goes back to sometimes we have, you know, we issue week kind of prediction center issues week one and week two forecasts. Sometimes there's a lot more skill in those forecasts, and sometimes there's a lot less skill. And it, it just depends on how these patterns are changing and how the models are handling it. So it, it's really a lot of times a very case specific type of, of thing that the models are dealing with. Sometimes they do all right and sometimes they don't. Okay, Jerry, Jerry writes and says, I've heard the Gulf Stream has slowed in recent years. Is it true? Is that true? And if so, will it have an effect on these different patterns? Well, the, the Gulf Stream is associated, that is part of this whole anticyclonic gyre that's the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. Overall, the, the southern part of, of uh, the Atlantic and also the northern part have been much milder than average, and that's been associated not just with the, the Gulf Stream changes, but really this whole gyre. And so on, since this gyre lasts for decades at a time, you tend to see the same types of things with the, with the Gulf Stream current, which would be the western part of this anticyclonic gyre. I have a question while Henry's going through there. This is Nolan. Uh, I know huge interest in drought and with the drought we've just had here in the, in the western and central U.S. this year. Uh, what sort of progress towards drought predictability are you seeing? Our, our main predictability in predicting drought, you really need to be able to predict the weather patterns. In particular, the, where rainfall is located depends on the mean ridge and trough axes. You tend to have drier than average conditions downstream of the upper level ridge, wetter than average conditions downstream of the upper level trough. So if you get a very persistent pattern, ridge trough pattern, that can really, uh, that'll produce these very large scale drought or flood types of patterns. And we, we see that all the time. Um, as far as the drought across the south, typically, and we've had, we're just horrible drought for, uh, across from, from South Dakota down to Texas, you know, eastern Wyoming, Colorado, even into the western Iowa, western Minnesota and that. Um, let me think here. When you get to the southern part of that pattern where the drought is by far the worst, Typically, winter rainfall is very important because that, it, well, it, it just is. If you have, typically the winter rainfall is very important. If you have an El Nino, that's a mechanism to shift the Pacific jet stream south and bring a lot of rain across the southern part of the country. El Ninos for the southwestern U.S. and even the, the, the uh, southern plains and uh, Gulf Coast regions, El Ninos are oftentimes drought busters. You get, you get a good El Nino with good impacts and you can bust up a five-year drought like anything. Vice versa, La Nina, with La Nina, the jet stream in the storm track tends to be much further north and the southern part of the country stays drier than average. So initially this winter, we were expecting El Nino develop. We were expecting a moderation of the drought across the south, especially in the, the, the southern plains. El Nino didn't develop. So uh, 
our main predictability, again, is with, is with predicting El Nino and La Nina and their impacts. I've got a question here from Charles. He wants to know, is there a long-range pattern of Arctic ice melt related to the oscillations? Uh, there is. With the phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, for instance, the top pattern, the positive phase that we've been seeing roughly since 1980, We've been seeing milder than average conditions across the eastern U.S., but all of Eurasia has seen those milder conditions as well. So that, that really affects the, the southward extent of the, of the, especially the Siberian ice sheet, and we've seen much more melt across uh, of the Siberian ice pack. Um, I'm not sure the extent to what this pattern can be linked to Greenland ice melt or not. There's still a global warming issue involved here. But this is, a, this is a pattern that you can link to recurring conditions that certainly affect this, the strength and the extent of, of the ice sheets. Whereas in contrast, the negative phase of the PNA, the bottom left, that's its colder conditions, more cold air out of the north, colder across Eurasia. You can really you know, further develop those ice packs for, for years and years at a time. So this pattern is, has impacts on the ice sheets for sure. Um, and it's... I don't think there's any question it's it's helped to uh, weaken them over the last couple of decades, but overall impacts really you really need to take global warming into account as well. Lisa writes and she she's heard the so called wild cards she says that have affected uh, affect winter weather patterns. What are they? And she wanted to know that is the NAO one of those wild cards? Uh, yes, it is, and the wild cards are these teleconnection patterns, these Pacific, or these jet stream teleconnection patterns when you don't have any link to the tropical rainfall, because there's just a, a whole lot of week to week and month to month variability in the jet streams. It's just the inherent way the atmosphere is. Sometimes the patterns will last for a week. Sometimes they'll last for a month or a season. And we have almost no predictability uh, of that, really, predictability. As far as the NAO, you have some, and you, you could say, well, we're in the warm, this positive phase of the NAO overall, uh, maybe it'll persist. But the minute that phase swaps, the minute that switches like it did in 2010, you all of a sudden have a lot of cold and snow in the eastern U.S. 95, 96 winter was a similar thing. So we, we, these are these teleconnection patterns that I'm talking about are the big wild cards in the seasonal prediction game. Jim and Katie from California write in, and they want to know what causes the variation in the lateral extent of the jet stream, the stronger, weaker sections as you go along the jet stream. <clears throat> I'm assuming just this, just a, in general, a, a general type of question. Uh, yeah. There's there's many things that affect the jet stream. The Pacific jet stream this is the average Pacific jet stream again. The Pacific jet stream position is fundamentally tied to the tropical rainfall patterns. Normally the rainfall is heaviest in the west and it's almost shut down in the east. That rain, when you have heavy rainfall in the west, that's deep tropical convection. That heats the atmosphere. That builds up the high pressure. That helps to establish the north, the jet stream, because the jet stream on that northern flank of that, the jet stream is pinned to the northern flank of this subtropical high. And that's crucially controlled by the rainfall patterns. When you go further east, to the east, central, and eastern Pacific, once the rainfall uh, tropical convection lessens, Normally, you don't have that big high pressure at upper levels. So in the bottom line is the tropical rainfalls are establishing this large-scale pressure pattern that then pins where the jet's going to be, how strong it's going to be, and also where it's going to weaken. Where the jet stream weakens is where, you, where these pressure contours fan out. You see them very close together, and then they fan out. That fanning is partly linked to the tropical rainfall patterns. So the these, these, this position of the Pacific jet stream and it's where it goes to and how far it extends or not in a given year is strongly controlled by the tropical rainfall patterns. That's why El Nino and La Nina are so important. 
Now, you can also have struck uh, changes in the jet stream linked to mid-latitude weather patterns as well. The Atlantic jet stream is a little harder to pin down, but that is also linked to you've got south of the Atlantic jet stream, you've got the heavy monsoon region of the Amazon basin. That helps to establish the high pressure to the north. Now, also at the same time, there's lower pressure to the south. This mid-latitude pattern is partly linked up with the Pacific rainfall pattern. So in other words, if you had just a normal Pacific rainfall, you're going to get a trough in the a ridge in the west, trough in the east. That trough is the Hudson Bay low. That in combination with the heating from the tropics tends to produce, tighten up these contours again and establish the entrance region of the Atlantic jet stream. So there's many factors involved. Tropical rainfall is a very important one. The land-ocean temperature contrasts are also important. Uh, so it's, it's many things that come together to, to give us these positions. And then the, the variability then is more linked up with tropical rainfall patterns or just the inherent fluctuations in the jet stream. Okay, here's just what, a quick uh, oh, observational I, yeah, I just a quick observational question. You should show those great uh, uh, temperature anomaly patterns over the tropical Pacific. Where does the data come from from which those uh, analyses are drawn? Oh my, we've got a huge, NOAA has been, and the Weather Service, of course, you know, you need observations to understand what's going on and also to support, uh, to give the initial conditions for models to make predictions. There is an extensive, it's the, called the Toga Tau Array of buoys, and it was put out in the Pacific Ocean for the purpose of being able to monitor and, and predict the Pacific Ocean temperatures with El Nino and La Nina. Now we also have ships, um, aircraft now, now we have satellites that can you know, get a, a broader measure of Atlantic Ocean temperatures and so on. But the, the uh, huge Toga Tau array of buoys is really fundamental at, at getting us our measurements. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much for that. That's a lot of people ask that question. Jerry, we've got time for a couple more questions here. We, we've okay. got one from Ginger who wants to know about the timing. Uh, during a strong El Nino, what is the time frame upon which the U.S., the eastern U.S. would feel its effects? So I, I think she's trying to figure out once it gets going, how long does it take to, to start feeling these effects? Well, it, it kind of depends on when the event forms and how strong it becomes. Also for the eastern U.S. the impacts depend on other things like the North Atlantic Oscillation as well. To tip, a typical life cycle of El Nino and La Nina would be maybe they'd start to develop late summer and into the fall. They reach peak strength during the winter and into maybe March and then they'll often weaken quite a bit as you go into April and May and then maybe dissipate during May or April, May, June, July time frame. So they last roughly anywhere nine months to 12 months or so. Typically there's not much impact in the U.S. in summer because either there is no El Nino or La Nina or they're just developing. When they are developing, the biggest impact would really be on how they're affecting the Atlantic hurricane activity. El Nino tends to suppress the activity, hurricanes, La Nina favors conditions that are more conducive to hurricane activity. An example this year, we thought El Nino was going to develop in time to, to suppress part of the latter part of the hurricane season. El Nino developed and of course it didn't and we saw 19 named storms. So that's how important these predictions of El Nino and La Nina are. Um, the main impacts for North America, the eastern U.S. are re really eastern half, North America really, uh, is during the winter. That's when El Nino and La Nina have their biggest impacts on the Pacific jet stream and that's when our weather is most strongly controlled by the winter jet stream or strongly influenced by the Pacific jet stream. So the, mo the most important impacts are really during the winter time. Okay, Jerry, we're going to take two more questions here. Okay. 
wind it up for today. And, and those of you who we haven't had a chance to answer your question, Jerry will follow up in the next week or so with you and, and hopefully uh, be able to answer what, you, what you've written. Uh, Abby writes, and she wants to know, how does the jet stream impact both uh, commercial aviation and, and planes in the air and so forth? Well, the jet stream has big impacts. If you're flying westward and you've got a strong jet stream, it's going to take you longer to go west. I remember this was back, oh, mid-90s or so, I, I, one of the airlines, I forget what it was, they said, well, man, we're really paying a lot of fuel and it's taking us extra time to get out west. What's going on? And I tracked it back to, oh, there was a very persistent jet stream pattern that they weren't, mod they weren't uh, changing their, their course uh, accordingly, their, their track, their uh, flight uh, paths. And of course, as you, if you know, if you fly from west to east in winter, you go, you get to the east coast a lot faster than getting to the west coast. So it is, it is big impacts. And I, I'm not an aviation person, so I don't know how they um, adjust everything, but I know it's important for them. And they have their own staff meteorologists. They know where the jet streams are. They know where the storm formation regions are and so on. Okay, and here's our, here's our last question of the day. This is from Jackson, and Jackson wanted to know if there's a relationship between undersea geothermal activity from plate tectonics and ocean temperature, and so how that affects all these things. Uh, generally, no. Um, I'm not an expert by any means on, on plate tectonics. That is more... But what we do see is that you have, for instance, in the Pacific Ocean, there's a, a it's called the um, oceanic thermocline, and it's really the bound. The oceanic thermocline is the boundary between the surface water and then the very deep ocean waters. And the 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 height of the thermocline varies, but it in general it, it it's 300 feet deep in the western uh, 300 meters deep in the western pacific and it can come up to near the surface in the eastern pacific during la nina those temperature patterns that we see on year to year time scales you really don't see any signal below the oceanic thermocline so we're not seeing any in other words we're not seeing changes in changes in the surface ocean temperatures linked to something deeper they tend to be, the temperatures tend to be, changes that we see tend to be really at the, um, above the thermocline. Now, now, from a paleoclimate perspective, which is a much long, hundreds of years or centuries or things, I don't, I, I'm not a paleoclimate person and I, I really wouldn't have the foggiest idea if, if these uh, Deep temperature changes affect the climate on longer time scales. That I can't answer. But for the time scales I'm talking about here, there doesn't seem to be much of an impact. Well, Jerry, thanks for taking time out of your busy day. This is a very informative uh, presentation today. I, I know our audience really uh, appreciates you being with us. And uh, again, thanks, thanks from us here at Coco Ross. Um, we, uh, we hope to keep in touch with you here in the future. Well, th thank you. It's been a real pleasure putting this talk together and talking about some of these patterns that affect all of us. Thanks, well, Jerry, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Well, before you guys leave, we ask you to take the survey at the end of today's webinar, and then we uh, have another webinar coming up in just a couple weeks here. On February 7th, it will be our next Kokoros webinar. That will feature Pat Kennedy of Colorado State University's Chill Radar program, and Pat's going to to talk about an introduction to Doppler and dual polarization weather radar should be very exciting uh, and, and so uh, we'll have something on the website here shortly to register for that again we're recording this presentation and we'll have all that up hopefully by the end of the week so from Fort Collins this is Henry along with Nolan and the rest of the gang saying so long and have a great afternoon <laughs>